bless the Lord, bless the Lord, bless the Lord on my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. I bring you greetings in the name of Sound Doctrine Deliverance Ministries of Emporia, Virginia. I am Elijah. Prophet Sarah is over there. Um, we want to send a special, special hello. God bless you to Pastor Rainey, as always, over in the Philippines, ministering and teaching the Word of God. We want to send a special hello to Bishop Bunn, Curtis Bunn, down in uh, North Carolina. A special hello to Apostle Thornton in Norfolk, Virginia. And all of our other friends and families and fellow workers and laborers in the name of Jesus Christ. It has been a while since I have been with you, but God is still great. God is still on the throne. We have been very busy ministering the word of God, hearing the Holy Spirit, seeking direction for our next step as to what he would have us to do. As I shared with you before, the conference was wonderful. The conference was absolutely beautiful, putting Christ back in Christianity. It was powerful. It was impactful. And, and I praise God because he's already given us the subject matter for our next conference, which will be in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. Praise God. I thank those of you who were able to come out and support. I thank those of you who sent out your prayers. I thank those of you who promoted. God bless you. God keep you. God always shine upon you. We have a beautiful, beautiful subject for tonight. God laid something on my heart about a week, a week and a half ago, and I wanted to come to you Thursday, but in all things, I'm going to be obedient. So if the Lord said on this day, this Sabbath, then that's what it was going to be. So I praise God just for the opportunity to come to you tonight. But before we do anything, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we truly give thanks for this day. We give thanks as always for your holy and divine presence. We ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, if we have done or said or thought anything that is unpleasing in your sight, that, Father, you would grant us forgiveness even right now in the name of Jesus. Wash us again, O oh God, in the blood of the Lamb. We thank you, Father, because your provision, Father God. We thank you for your support. We thank you for your protection. We thank you, Father God, because you have never left us nor forsaken us. So, Father, even at this very hour, as we go into your word, we ask yet again, Holy Spirit, that you anoint me with that anointing that makes teaching and preaching your word easy. I ask, Father God, those who would take the time to listen, that you would give them ears to hear what your spirit is saying to the church. I ask, Father God, that you continue to build us up through your holy word, continue to give us all direction and guidance in the name of Jesus, that we can be found guilty of being about your business. Father God, I ask in the name of Jesus that any distractions that will come to me or any of those who would try to hear that, Father, you remove them right now, even in the name of Jesus. Breathe on us, O oh God, that peace that surpasses all understanding during this hour of study. We love you, Lord. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. It is so very important that we um, open up with prayer. And I apologize to you all because I haven't been doing that before. I would pray before I came on so I could get right into it with you. But Holy Spirit let me know that before each of these studies, we're going to open up together and prayer because we know there's power in prayer. Amen. Now, before we get to the subject matter, let me say this to you all, my brothers and sisters, especially again, you young brothers and sisters that's starting off in your ministry, or even some of you seasoned ones that's already in your ministry. We have to have an understanding on this. The word of God is the word of God. Okay. Now, we understand that when it was translated from its original language over to the Queen's English, when it was translated into Germany, when it was translated into all of these other languages, we understand that with each language, the definition of the words may change. And when you start to change the definition of words, you can change the impact of what's being said. We understand this. But we also must be mindful that God was not ignorant of this because God knew that his word had to be changed. 
So for those people who always want to try to find contradictions or flaws or discrepancies in the word of God, we simply say God gave us exactly what he knew we needed to have to understand who Jesus is. We still have the ability to define the words in their original language. And it's so very important that those of you who teach the word of God, those of you who preach the word of God, those of you who study the word of God, to always take time to look up the words in their original language so that you can learn one of the key secrets to effective ministry and effective life. And that's part of what this lesson is about tonight. Before I really get into it, I, I want to share some scripture with you and I I beg that you write them down. It's important that you write them down. The first one is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. 1 Corinthians, I'm so excited about this lesson tonight. Y'all have no idea. Listen. Oh, it's some meat and some power in this. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. The word of God says, For God is is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And that's self-explanatory. Where there's confusion, God is not in it. Where there's bickering and back and forth, God is not in it. God says what he says. God means what he says. God's word does not change because we don't agree with it. And God is not about confusion. God, if, if, we, if we put him in today's, in today's uh, thought process, God is that smooth one that sits back with his arms crossed. While everybody else is going back and forth saying all they got to say, he says nothing. But when he speaks, the whole room gets quiet. You hang on every word he says. And after he's finished speaking, all of the gibbering and jabbering that was going on, it stops. Because you have perfect clarity as exactly what he meant. That's God. He is not the author of confusion. And it's important that you remember that when we get into this study. The second one is still in 1 Corinthians, but go to chapter 11. I'm going to set something up, and then we're going to break it down. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 Verse 2 and 3. Listen. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. This is Paul, the commandments. Keep the commandments. Keep the things that he taught you as he, got, as he taught them to you. Remember what Paul taught. Remember what Paul taught. Remember what the Holy Spirit gave Paul to teach us. He says, remember these things. Why? But I would have you know, listen, that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. Let me read that scripture to you again. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Now it's important that we understand what it means when it says the head of Christ is God. Because you will have some that will try to make it a hierarchy. Saying that it's, it's power rankings in the Trinity, that, that, that Christ is less than. We cannot be ignorant about this. So turn with me, if you will, to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself 
and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Listen, when the word says the head of every man is Christ, that is self-explanatory. Christ is above and the head of every man. He has more authority. He has more power. He has more say-so. He is the leader of man. It says that the head of every woman is the man. This is the order that God established. Paul didn't establish it. Peter didn't establish it. Uh, Wampa Dillon didn't establish it. God established this. But then it said the head of Christ is God. Now understand, in the spirit, in the, in, the, in the annals of eternity, we know there is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but there's only one God. And they are all equally God. They all think alike. They all breathe alike. They, they are all of one substance. It is one God, plain. But when Christ took on the likeness of flesh and came to earth, he submitted himself. He humbled himself under the leadership and authority of his father. This is what this passage is talking about. We're not talking about in eternity sense. We're talking about right here in the natural. He humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. He took on flesh and was obedient to everything that his father told him to do. That's why he made the statement, my father is greater than I. Because he had to suffer death. He had to be obedient in all things. He had to fulfill the law. So let's make sure we have perfect understanding on that passage of scripture. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. That's why that passage is written this way. Now that we have understanding on that, let's go to Ephesians. This is the last scripture, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. We're going to start at verse 20. Listen to what the Word of God says. Giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Did you hear the word of God? Let me read it again, because even though you hear my voice, you didn't hear the word of God. Hear the word of God. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Did you hear the word of God? It's a reason why the Holy Spirit had me read these passages that I read. As I was at work the other day, <clears throat> excuse me, and I was meditating on this lesson, I was meditating on the word, Holy Spirit told me something so profound that it literally blew my socks off. And I've been chewing on this thing because as I thought about the words that he told me, and I thought about everything that I see and I know that goes on in the church, it was so in your face, but so overlooked. And what the Holy Spirit told me is, the hardest thing for religious people, listen, the hardest thing for religious people to do in the church today is keep the word of God in context. Did you hear what I said? The Lord let me know the hardest thing 
for religious people to do in the church today is to keep his word in context. And it shouldn't surprise you because people have learned one of the tricks of the enemy and that's make the word fit however you want it to fit. It's taking the word of God completely out of context to fit your agenda. It's taking a passage of scripture and making it mean whatever you want it to mean, even though that's not how God intended it to be interpreted. And, and the problem is so many people have gotten so good at doing it that you can take a passage and you can lead an entire flock straight to hell because of the way you choose to interpret the word of God. Now understand this. Here's my disclaimer. This isn't my word. Elijah Jeremiah did not write a single page of this Bible. I did not write the scripture. Holy Spirit did not use me and inspire me to write any of these books or letters in this word. So it's not mine. Therefore, what would be responsible for me is that if I'm going to refer to this book, if I'm going to refer to these letters, then I need to find out what the author's intent was when they wrote what they wrote. I need to find out who the author was talking to. What was he talking about? What was going on at that time? How are the words defined that the author used for whomever he was talking to? And then see how it applies to me in my life today. But as God let me know just the other day, too many people are too busy taking his word and taking it out of context because it fits their agenda. And God is not pleased. So, why are we talking about this today? There's a movie that's out right now. It's been playing for a week, two weeks. It's called Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. Honk for Jesus, save your soul. Now, in this movie, two beautiful actors and actresses, uh, Sterling Brown, those of you, you might remember him from This Is Us, and, and Regina Hall, who is just so underrated, beautiful. But they play a husband and a wife that's in ministry. Now, those of you who've been around for a while and haven't been living under a rock, if you've seen the movie, you know that the majority of his role is based off of the late Eddie Long. It's no secret. The, the character he plays in this movie, if you watch it, is Eddie Long. Plain and simple. Um, I don't know much about Eddie Long's wife, don't know what she's been through, but the, the role that Regina plays as the first lady, if you will, if you pay attention, you would have a sympathetic spirit towards her until you get towards the end and you listen to the words that she speak. But, but this movie, Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul, it's not just a movie about Eddie Long and some of the things he went through. I love this movie. When the wife and I went to see this movie, it was maybe five people in the whole theater. And when we came out, we ran into two ladies and a young man. And we stood right at that door and we were talking about this movie for a good 20, 30 minutes. Because the one lady who was also in ministry, she was upset about this thing. She thought it was blasphemous. And to the untrained eye, the untrained mind, it might appear that way. Until we let her know who the movie was about. Then she recalled the things that went on with the late Eddie Long. But more than that, when you look at this movie, this movie tells on so many of these so-called mega preachers, it tells or it makes you look at some of your favorite ministers in a different light. The man in this movie, the, 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 the pastor was fixated 
or stuff. Listen to me. He realized, his wife realized, that the church can be used as a get-rich-quick scheme. They realized that the church could be used for, for suits, for clothes, for cars, for wealth, for, for, for sex. If you was charismatic enough, if you was funny enough, if you dressed a certain way, if you looked a certain way, people are going to come. And this is what's sad because it's true about the church today. If you see somebody and they dressed a certain way and they driving this, that, or the other, and they got their jewels on and they always got money and they got their helicopter and their jets and their church is huge with all these people coming in, just because of your physical appearance, a lot of people join that church. Now, if you also paid attention to this movie, you found out that he knew just enough word to get himself in trouble. He knew just enough scripture to take it and to twist it to mean however he wanted it to mean. And there was always going to be those same group of folk sitting in the church somewhere saying amen and hallelujah to everything he said, even when he was teaching false doctrine because it sounded good. Because they were too lazy to search the scripture for themselves. They were too ignorant as to what the word of God meant. So anything that the preacher said had to be right. And if it wasn't right, it sounded good and he looked good. So they said amen to it. This movie pulled the curtain off of these mega churches that we have today. It exposed it for what it was because it showed how they are behind the scenes. And it told on so forth. It's a lot of church folk in big churches that hate this movie. They don't like it. They talk about it. They bash it. I love it because it's exposing some things. There's parts in this movie where his flaws are being exposed. But now here's the thing about church folk. As, as I was talking to my bishop a couple weeks ago, we were just having a discussion as we rode, and, and he was telling me about some things that, that he was aware of from the past with some other people and how unforgiving and how relenting, unrelenting church folk are, Christian folk are. It's amazing that when you fall or when you have a past, how the world can forgive and how the world will embrace you. But when it comes to so-called church folk, when it comes to so-called Christian folk, they are the most unforgiving, unrelenting, foul-mouthed, nastiest people on the face of the earth until they're the ones that need forgiveness, until they're the ones that need a second chance. Amen. And this movie exposes that. Now, in the movie, the man did whatever he did, and the movie lets you know what he did. How long ago it was, we don't know. But he did whatever he did. And he was trying to find redemption, it appears. But the truth is, if you pay attention, he was not looking for redemption. He was looking to get back into the limelight because he missed the stuff. And if you listen to his wife, because we're sympathetic with her throughout the whole movie, but at the end, she made it clear what her motive was when she told her husband, you need to do what you need to do to get me back up on the stage. Now also, when you pay attention to this movie, it's another young couple, the Sumters. And they have their own church. And they are competing with the main people in the church. It's the same spirit in the world today. I have told you, brothers and sisters, over and over and over again, the word of God says we are one body. Jesus prayed, Father, allow them to be one as we are one. The scripture tells us on the day of Pentecost, they were in the upper room on one accord. The scripture tells us that we're all supposed to be teaching and preaching and believing the same thing. But just like the movie Exposed, there's a competition going on. They were actually praying for somebody else in ministry's downfall so that they would be elevated. And it's sad, but it's exposing what goes 
goes on in the church today, which is why the church is not as effective today as it should be, because instead of embracing each other and supporting each other, we have now gotten in a position where it's easy to tear each other down to try to build yourself up. But the sad part is, whomever the Holy Spirit chooses to elevate, that's who's going to elevate. Satan can't elevate you, but you're only going to go so far. But when God elevates you, no man can bring you down. But in the movie, this young couple is in competition with this older couple. And if you look at the movie and you don't know what you're looking at, you're going to love this young couple. But that brings us back to the scriptures that we gave. Because the original couple is the pastor and his wife, the first lady. The young couple our co-pastors, listen, the word of God is the word of God. In this statement that I'm about to make, a whole lot of people going to be mad. A whole lot of people going to be upset. A whole lot of people going to wish things upon me. A whole lot of people going to try to slander my name. I don't care. You can do what you want to do because I just told you a few minutes ago, it's not my word. It's the word of God. God does not change his word based on how we feel. So let me make this perfectly clear for all of my young ministers starting your ministry off. Listen, biblically, there is no such thing as a co-pastor. In the word of God, it does not exist. God is not the author of confusion. When you've seen the order that God set, the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. The head of Christ is God. Notice in each position, only one head was named. So when you have a church and you have a pastor, the pastor is the head of that particular congregation. The pastor is the one that God gives word to about that particular flock. It is the pastor's responsibility to do the things that God instructs him to do. There is no such thing as a co-pastor because what that means is you have two heads and that's out of order because that's not what God established. Now, let me give you a brief outline of something that looked like it has two heads. In the beginning, God gave Adam instruction. After God gave Adam instruction, he made Eve. Adam was the head of Eve. And then this serpent came along. And this serpent started talking to Eve. And the, the things that he was talking to her about was conflicting with what God gave Adam. And Eve, listen women, you're about to get real mad. It's all right. It's scripture. The same spirit, Adam called Eve the mother of all living. The first woman, the mother of all living. And the spirit of Eve is still in a lot of church women today. What do I mean? Eve lied on God. Eve said that God told her something that God didn't tell her. Eve changed the word of God for whatever reason she had to fit her purpose. God never told her anything about touching that fruit, but she said that God said you shall not eat it or touch it. She lied. She altered the word of God. That is your first example in scripture of false doctrine. Understand me. It is your first example of false doctrine. It's the first example of somebody saying God told them something God did not tell them. And that same spirit is with a lot of women in church today. If you're a woman and you say God told you that you're supposed to be a pastor, God told you you're an apostle, God told you you're a bishop, it's the same spirit Eve had, you're a liar. Because nowhere in scripture does God ever put a woman in that position. The head of every woman is the man. So if you call yourself a pastor or an apostle or a bishop, that means you're the head of a man. That is contrary to what the word of God says. It can't be both ways. But again, when you take scripture out of context to fit your purpose, then people are going to believe you. Now, I said, I told you before, you can do whatever you want to do. You can do whatever you want to do. You can be whatever you want to be. But have enough integrity and respect for God to not lie on him. If you want to be a pastor, be a pastor. 
If you want to call yourself the chief apostle, call yourself the chief, call whatever you want to call. But stop saying God called you to that because it goes against his word. It's a lie. Now back to this movie. The young couple were co-pastors. And here's the issue. There are parts in the movie where the older couple and the young couple, they don't agree. So how are you going to have a head and the head cannot agree? How can you lead the congregation if you have two different thought processes? How can you lead a congregation if you believe one way and your co-pastor believe another way and then you're going to bring confusion in the church when we just started off with this lesson and it's saying God is not the author of confusion? How can that be? It can. It's not of God. So this is what we need to understand. Because some of you might say, well, sister so-and-so is my pastor or my apostle, and, and I seen God do this, and I seen God do that, and, and it's blessed. Listen, let, let me let me let me let me make this clear to you. The name of Jesus does not change. The gifts are not going to stop being gifts because you misuse them. The name of Jesus is not going to lose power because you misuse it. The name of Jesus is going to do what it does. The gifts are going to do what the gifts do. So if you are in a position and God is still blessing that position, it has nothing to do with you. It's honoring his name and his word above everything else. You're still out of order. This is why we have another passage of scripture where it says in that day, many are going to say, Lord, in your name, we healed the sick. In your name, we did this. In your name, we did that. And what did he say? Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. The people who made that statement, they saw results when they used his name because the name is still the name. The power is still the power, but they were still out of order and God still disowned them. So just because you might say, well, my pastor, she did this, she prayed about this, or she taught this. Yes, the word is still the word. She is still a liar. She is still out of order. Period. There's no way around it. And I don't care what scripture she try to flip or what scripture she take out of context. It's not of God. There is no such thing as a co-pastor in the Bible. There's no such thing as a woman apostle or a woman pro uh, pastor in, in the Bible. Prophets, yes. The other things, no. And for those of you who want to try to bring up Junia, those of you who want to hang your hat on Junia, let me help you when you rightly divide the word of God. When you look at the scripture and it says Junia was known or outstanding among the apostles, when you rightly divide the word of God, it simply means this. In the circle that the apostles traveled in, she was well known and she was a helper, but she was not an apostle. Period. Nothing to get deep about. And it wasn't until the 14th century when they tried to make her an apostle because it fit somebody's agenda. But Junia was not, was not, and is not an apostle. Stop it. Shame on you. Rightly divide the word of God and keep it in context. Secondly, people don't know if Junia or Junius was a man or a woman. But that's a whole other subject. We're not going to spend our time on that. We're focusing on this. God is saying we have to keep his word in context. We have to. And listen, for all of my young brothers and sisters that's in whatever aspect of ministry you're in, listen. Being successful in the eyes of man. Because when you watch this movie, both of these couples were successful to a degree. They had money. They had TV programs. They had the mega church that seated thousands of people. They had clothes. They had cars. They had jewelry. They were successful in the eyes of man. And people would think that, that the church was booming because of their success. But hear me and hear me well. Being successful in the eyes of man does not mean you're significant in the eyes of God. 
Do you understand me? You can have all of the success according to man's statute and be so insignificant in the eyes of God that it's sad. So just because you have money, just because you have Prada and you have the gators on and you have the red bottoms, just because you got the fur coats on and you got five or six cars, you got three or four jets, you got a helicopter, you got a mansion, you got 20, 30,000 people that tune into your program every, every, whatever you do it. And you look at that as a measure of success. But in the kingdom, you are insignificant. Because you are doing nothing to build the kingdom. You're building your portfolio. You're building your reputation. You're not building the kingdom. You're not building up the lives of the people that God is allowing to come before you. Listen. How many mega preachers do you know that have these millions of dollars? How many of them do you know that actually take the time to go to their flock to find out who's hurting, who's struggling, who's in need, and take care of their bills and put their food in their refrigerator? I'm not talking about giving you $20 and telling you to go get a meal at the church. I'm talking about taking care of your flock. Because that's what the money that comes into the church is for. To take care of God's house and God's people. If you, if you haven't seen this movie, I beg you to watch it. Honk for Jesus, save your soul. Please watch this movie. You don't even have to go to the movies to see it. It's streaming. But it exposes the lies that's going on in the church today. And I'm not just talking about what they were doing. I'm talking about the lies about co-pastoring. I'm talking about the, 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 listen. We are living in a time where now more than ever, people need to be serious about Jesus. You have to have a personal relationship that is rock solid, that nobody can destroy because it's too many crafty, lying people out here in the pool pit perpetrating a fraud but they sound good because Satan tells them just enough scripture to get in your ear to get in your pocket and they don't care nothing about you or your soul it's too many of them out here too many of them and too many people are falling for the lies because it's what you have been taught it's time that we re-educate the people of God to what the word of God says and not what people want it to say because it fits their agenda. I told you not too long ago, I was down in my bishop's church and he had a, a, a woman pastor come in and she preached a message and she lost me as soon as she opened her mouth. Not because she was a woman pastor, but because the stuff she was saying. Because one of the things she said was, preachers post the amen are the preachers. Now, you say amen, and if you don't know, let me educate you. When you say amen, it's just like somebody's writing a statement to God, and when you say amen, you're co-signing that statement. So when someone prays, if you do not agree with every single word of the prayer, do not say amen to it. When someone preaches... If you do not agree, line upon line, precept upon precept, with every word they're speaking, do not say amen to it. I don't care how much they stand in the church and beg you to say amen. Y'all heard it before when they get up there. Oh, y'all ain't giving me no help. I need somebody to talk to me. Y'all ain't talking to me now. The more you talk to me, the faster I get over. Listen, stop all that foolishness. Stop it. Stop begging for people to respond to your word. If the Holy Spirit gave you the word to say, say the word whether they respond or not. But back to this lady. She said, preachers are supposed to amen other preachers. And I still looked at her like she was crazy. I'm not saying amen to the things she was saying because I didn't agree with anything she was saying. So it was another part in her message where she was talking about what God called her to do. That was a lie because it was not scripture. And then this is the scripture that she tried to use that so many people try to use. It says, in Christ, there is no Jew, no Greek, no male, no female, no bond, no free. She tried to use that 
to say this is why she's allowed to be a woman pastor or co-pastor or whatever she called herself. And this goes back to what God was saying at the beginning. She took the scripture out of context. So for those of you who heard that before, let me help you. When you keep the word of God in context, and it's talking about in Christ, there is no Jew, there's no Greek, there's no bond, there's no free, there's no male, there's no female. You can say there's no black, there's no white, there's no young, there's no old. What is this talking about? When you keep it in the context it was given, it was talking about in terms of salvation. Because the Jews tried to make a separation between them and the Gentiles. But that was law. Under grace, when it comes to accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, there is no thing to divide one from another. Everybody, whomsoever will, is accepted in Christ when it comes to salvation. Keep it in context. But it's too easy to take it out of context and to get people to believe you because they have the same agenda. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I find funny. And I'm sure you may have seen it before. I know a lady. She has a church. And she calls herself the chief apostle. Now, an apostle is one thing. But a chief apostle, let me tell you what this means. To call yourself the chief apostle means in any given area, in any square mile area, you are the apostle that everyone else, they're under your authority. They're under your leadership. That's a chief apostle. So this is what I need somebody to help me understand because maybe Elijah is just ignorant to certain things. But if your church is on A block and there's a church on B block, C block, D block, and E block, and it's all right there in the same neighborhood, how is everybody in them churches calling themselves the chief apostle? God is not the author of confusion. But this is what we see when we take time to look at the condition of the church. How is God going to make you the chief apostle when, first of all, it goes against his word, and secondarily, you got five chief apostles on the same block? It's confusion because people are getting too caught up in titles. Now, let me help you with this because I've had this question before too. Is it a title? Does God give out titles? When you look up the word, title is not in scripture. Function is not in scripture. The term office is in scripture. When God places somebody in the office of a pastor, the office of a prophet. But when you go to your thesaurus, title and function is the exact same word. It's just used differently. They're interchangeable. They're synonyms. So people stop getting hung up on what somebody else is saying you have or don't have. A title and a function is the same thing as your office. You can use any one of the three words that you want to. Let's just make it simple. But, back to this. If you're in a church with a co-pastor, this is what you need to do. Ask them to take you anywhere within this 66 and show you a co-pastor. Take you anywhere within the 66 and show you where God put two heads in the same place. Where he put two shepherds over the same flock. It does not exist in the word of God. So the question you have to ask yourself is, if it doesn't exist in the word of God, by whose authority are they doing it? And if you follow it, what are you following? Because Jesus said there is no middle ground. You're either for me or you're against me. That means this word. You're either for this word or you're against this word, but you can't have it both ways. You're either going to follow everything that God say or don't follow nothing that he say. It's up to you. But I beg you, watch this movie. Hope for Jesus, save your soul. Watch it. Pray before you watch it, but watch it. Because it shares the light 
or what I have been telling you for years and what's still going on in the church today. A lot of your favorite preachers are frauds. They're in it for your dollars. They're in your pocket. They care about being successful in this world when they're so insignificant in the eyes of God. How do you know when you're significant to God? Because you're winning souls for Christ. Because your first obligation is to Jesus and the kingdom. Because you care about people. You love people. You want to see people healed. You want to see people delivered. You want to see people taught. You want to rightly divide the word. You're going to admit when you're wrong. You're not, you're, you're not going to flout and tote yourself. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It has nothing to do with you. So when you see those ones that get real defensive, he can't tell me what God told me. I don't have to tell you. God told you. Show it to the people in the word. The word defends itself. The word stands on its own and the word does not change because we don't agree with something. If the word says, God said, let there be light. It means God said, let there be light. We can't say that, that, that angel Michael made the light and when it blew out, Gabriel went and bought batteries to put a new light in. The word said, God said, let there be light, period. God said it, that settles it. Whether you believe it or not, it does not change. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. The head of Christ is God. That does not change. There is no such thing biblically as a co-pastor. And I will say it and say it and say it until it sinks in your head. It's no such thing in the word of God as a co-pastor. You don't even see senior pastor in the word of God. Nowhere. Now we as pastors, we train up people to walk into their pastorship if that's what God called them to. Yes, we train them up for that. We teach people how to teach the word of God. We teach people how to preach the word of God. That's what the home alleged class is all about. So if you're a pastor, you're a pastor. There's no such thing as a co-pastor. Period. So if you're offended by what I said, take it up with God. But he ain't going to change his word for you. If you want to be mad at me, be mad at me. I can take it. I don't care if you're mad or not. And I don't say that to be brash. I say it because it's the truth. If I'm standing on the word of God, I don't have time to worry about who's mad and who's not mad. I'm standing on the word of God. God takes care of all of that because it's his word. But it's time that we wake up and start holding people accountable for the things that they claim they are and the things that they're saying God is telling them. Show some receipts, as they say now. Show me in the word so that I can be equipped if somebody else come to ask me this and I won't be standing around looking ignorant. Where in the word has God ever appointed a co-pastor? Where? And again, back to this movie. I'm going to say this with all the love I have in my heart. I'm going to say it with all the conviction I can muster up. Church people, my brothers and sisters in Christ, do you think Jesus was joking when he said, if you don't forgive, neither will Father in heaven forgive you? Do you think that was a joke? Do you think he really didn't mean that? I want you to take a moment and think about the weight of, of that scripture. If you don't forgive, neither will our Father in heaven forgive you. Think about that. Think about some of the stuff you did that you don't think nobody know about, but God knows. Think about some of the stuff that you did and said that you still haven't sought true repentance on because in your own self-righteous mind, you weren't wrong. 
think about the way you treat certain people because you think you got some dirt on them. Church folk are the most nasty, unforgiving, unyielding people walking the face of the earth. And it's crazy because Jesus said all men will know we're his disciples by the love we have one for another. Church folk don't love each other. It's too much fun to gossip and tear people down and belittle people until God turns the spotlight on you. And people start looking in your closet and under your bed. Then you want people to be sympathetic and forgive. But the same measure that you judge with is the same measure you're going to be judged with. That's the word of God. Rightly divided. Why do you think so many people don't want to come to the church when it comes to church hurt? Because church folk are the most gossiping, nosy people on the face of the earth who have nothing better to do but sit around spreading everybody's business out. And it's supposed to be a place for healing. It's supposed to be a place for refuge, for restoration, to be built up. So how do we make it right? How do we make it right? So the whole moral to this is simply this. Keep the word of God in context. Just because somebody claimed God called them something or God told them something, if it goes against his word, they're lying. They are liars, period. There's no other way to say it. It's a strong word, but it is what, if you're not telling the truth, you're lying. There's no such thing as a little white lie. If you're a liar, you're a liar. If you're lying, you're lying. There is no, no easier way to say it. But it's still time to correct it. There's nothing wrong, my sisters. There's nothing wrong with telling people, I preach and teach the word of God. I pastor the word of God because I have a love for it. And I'm able to do it. But stop lying on God saying he called you to do it because you're a liar. Don't watch me no more. Get mad at me. Don't say hi in the grocery store. It does not matter to me. What matters to me is that you're right with God and that you don't go before him still lying. What matters to me is that we start walking in the love that the word of God requires of us. And just because you forgive nobody, God didn't call you to be a fool. To forgive means you let it go. And when you see them, you don't shun them, if you will. You don't keep bringing things up. But that don't mean you still got to keep dealing with them. You don't have to keep dealing with people to, to, to walk in forgiveness. You can forgive. And you can chalk it up to experience. And you can pray their well-being in, in Christ from a sincere place. And you can keep moving. But we have to start exhibiting the love that God talks about. We have to start drawing people into the house of God. We have to start showing and displaying Jesus Christ like never before. Because if you look around the world right now, we already knew the world was crazy and chaotic. But this is it's getting out of the hand. You got people that ain't got nothing better to do but run around with knives and just start stabbing people. They done moved on from shooting up schools, if you will. You just got people that's running around the street stabbing folks. You don't know when your last opportunity to tell somebody you love them is going to be. You don't know when your last opportunity to seek forgiveness is going to be. You don't want to die caught in a lie. Get it right. Watch the movie. Honk for Jesus, save your soul. Watch that movie. Brothers and sisters, please watch that movie. And then look at some of your pastors. Look at them real good. Because that movie exposes a whole lot. 
Tell somebody you love them. Tell somebody you forgive them. Tell somebody you're praying for them. Show the love that Jesus called us to display one towards another. We'll be back next Saturday between 7, 7.30. Until then, walk in wisdom, grow in grace, know that I love you. God bless.